that ethereal sound, Ballade de la Fée, was performed and indeed rediscovered by my guest, the harpist Elizabeth Jane Baldry. She's perhaps been spending rather too long at the bottom of the garden, where she's picked up a passion for Victorian fairy music, practically unknown today, but which would have enchanted our great-great-grandparents in the front parlours of the high Victorian period. Elizabeth Jane, how did you first come across it? Years ago, I was reading a biography of the composer, Lord Berners. I've always actually had a fascination for anything that, though harmless, is on the fringe of respectability. Well, that's certainly Lord and Berners, that Lord Berners it? was that. And there was a little passage in there where he describes, as a kid, his only experience of music was his aunt's tinkering away at the piano, which left a lot to be desired. And one day, when he was in the library, he unearthed this old volume of pieces for the harp. And when he opened the volume and looked at the music with these architectural shapes of surging waves and rhythms, then it just conjured up for him. It, it evoked something. An ideal music was how he described it, an ideal music of which he as yet had had no conscious awareness. And that captured my imagination. I just wanted to find out what was this ideal music of surging waves and romantic titles. Where on earth do you actually find it? I mean, it's all very well reading about Lord Berners and his book of heart music, but that doesn't solve your problem, does it? I mean, wh where do you go and actually dig the music out? Well, the first thing I did was I did a little bit of research on 19th century harp history and the sorts of composers that were writing at the time. I wasn't interested in the good composers but the ones that were actually writing for the people, for the Victorians themselves and w armed with that list of composers I went one spring morning to the British Library and I looked at my first composer thinking that there would be in the list. Perhaps he might be mentioned if I was lucky. Well, there was his name and the list of works owned by the British Library ran to 17 pages long, <laughs> the list of all his works. So there was just this absolute wealth of music. There was so much and... Of course, there amongst it was the fairy music that I was searching for. It was just incredibly exciting and wonderful. And, of course, no one had been interested in it for years. And leafing through Great Grandmama's piano stool, you find those sort of dusty old inches thick volumes printed yes, on onion yes, paper with yes. sort of gloriously sounding names and pieces in them. Is it, is it the same kind of repertoire for harp music? Who, who yes. were these people and who were they writing for? Well... There was, for example, Charles Oberta. Now, he was a, a knight, and he was also the harp professor at the Royal Academy, one of the very first harp professors in the middle of the 19th century. And he was like a pop star of his day. He was so popular. He went all over Europe, playing everywhere. And he wrote over 450 works, including two operas. And most of it, of course, heavily biased in favour of the harp. And amongst it, this marvellous fairy harp music. A Fairy Legend, which is one of the pieces by Charles Oberta, is actually preceded by this marvellous little poem. Imagine a gentleman standing in a garden, watching all these diaphanous fairies dancing around him. That's the scene. A while they dance before him, then divide breaking like rosy clouds at eventide around the rich pavilion of the sun, till silently dispersing one by one through many a path that from the garden leads to temples, terraces and moonlit meads. Their distant laughter comes upon the wind, and but one trembling nymph remains behind. So how would you be feeling with a trembling nymph before you? <laughs> Normally I take those things in my stride. I'm sure you do, yes. It's very programmatic, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it's marvellous. It. Yes, yes. In fact, you'll hear the distant laughter of the fairies. You can actually hear it. This, this is it. Listen. Is it about the Victorian period, where you know, the, the love of uh, fairies in literature, in painting, in poetry, and particularly in music, w w was so much at the heart of that kind of Victorian parlour culture? Isn't it interesting? It's 
fascinating. The whole fairy scene embodies so many elements of the Victorian psyche. There was a lot going on at the time. It was a time of huge social change. So, for example, there was the revolt against Darwinism. People didn't really want to believe that we'd been monkeys. It was much nicer to believe we'd all come down from heaven. And there was the birth of the scientific age, so it was nice to believe in fairies instead of science. Do you think there's something there about the, the kind of inner world that was actually all more and more about materialism, to have the supernatural breaking oh, through? Oh, yes, I mean, yes, in, in the piece yes. we just heard where we hear the fairy laughter, you do have this sense of something intruding Isn't into the world. Yeah, it's yes, great. it's marvellous. And the... The spiritualist movement, which began, I think, in about the 1830s, that was hugely popular and quite respectable. You would have ladies would send invitations to tea and table tapping. And even Queen Victoria, of course, dabbled in a little bit of spiritualism, which would be quite politically incorrect nowadays. Is that something to do with, I suppose, death was a much more common experience yes, yes. and occurrence in Victorian society? Of course it was, yes, yes. I mean, there was a much higher mortality rate. Maybe that had something to do with it. There was the middle classes, of course. For the first time, there were huge numbers of people with money and leisure, but no taste, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> so these people would be spending their money on concert harps and having their, yes. um, their part of their daughter's accomplishment would Absolutely, be to be a harp. yes. Would these accomplished ladies, young ladies, playing the harp, be showing off more than technical skills, do you think? <laughs> Yes, they most certainly would be. Because the harp has seven pedals round the bottom, and often you have to do quite extensive work with your feet, and in order to avoid your Victorian gown getting stuck in the pedals, you have to raise your gown. And there are tales of women who were neither young nor handsome, but who still procured an excellent husband for themselves on account of a well-turned ankle. <laughs> because it was a very rare sight for a frustrated Victorian thrusting young man, wasn't it, to even <sighs> see an ankle or Yes, a and ankles are such naughty bits. There was a huge movement with a harp. It was the instrument. Every young lady needed to be able to play it. The stylophone of the 1850s. Yes, that's right. And it's interesting because... I have one beautiful Victorian harp, well, two actually, but, but one particularly lovely one, that when it was made in the 1840s, it then cost about £70, which at that time was the price of a house in Eaton Square in London. But I can tell you, if I could still swap it for a house in Eaton Square, I'd do it tomorrow. <laughs> but it's, um, they were very expensive, and so they were something to aspire to, the craftsmanship and the sound of these... Victorian instruments is absolutely sublime. And it's, a, of course, the perfect instrument to accompany fairy music. It, yes. is, it is the sound of fairy it music. It is the sound. The harp, for a long time, has been associated with magical... the magical element in life, really. Right back in the Bible, you had the harp being used to chase spirits, evil spirits, out of people. In the Celtic times, a chieftain would always be buried with a harp in his grave because it was considered as a bridge between man and the supernatural. Dance of the Spirits there, Elizabeth Jane Baldry. I mean, it, it sounds like a middle period Verdi, but then all of a sudden it heads off in a very different direction. Yes, it was written by an Italian with lots of marvellous effects in it. I wondered whether he didn't write it for his students because he was a harp professor himself. I mean, the theme itself, you know, you can imagine that played by a theatre band on a piano or something, but then it goes into these gushing, rushing yes. arpeggios. Listen, listen to these gushings. And this is the ideal music of surging waves that Lord Berners spoke of. And I can see what you mean, that in a way, fairy music is not so much about content, it's not so much about tunes, but it's about that quality of 
being evanescent. That, that, that gossamer thing, which is so much a yes, hallmark of heart music. Yes, yes, it's the textures and the lushness. It's a very liquid sound in the harp. It does have an ethereal quality to it. Is that, does that something that involves a sort of certain virtuosity, I guess, to achieve that, 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 that silky transparent? Yes, it is, actually. It's like ballet, I always think. You see a ballerina dancing or her partner lifting her up and there's a fuller grown woman and she has to look as if she weighs nothing. And the skill of it is that effortless quality. And with the heart, very much so, it needs to look as if it's totally effortless and flowing out of your fingers. That's very Victorian, isn't yes, it? To yes. give the appearance of effortlessness. That's in fact, right. it's all about these huge forces. Yes, huge, it? huge, yes. I mean, you have to develop massive muscles. These hands you see before you <laughs> are immensely strong. But that's very interesting, again, because it is seen as something that, you know, polite, respectable middle-class ladies might acquire on the Tuesday afternoons in the music room. But actually, it's highly demanding, highly technically, high levels of technical skill required to play. I mean, you look at the music on the page and you can see that this is absolutely virtuoso stuff. Yes, that's very interesting. I can't fathom that out. Whether these harpist composers, the ones who actually performed and played it, published it all in order to say, well, look how brilliant I am, I can play this stuff. Or maybe the young ladies bought it to aspire to. Or maybe there really were young ladies who were good enough to play it because their poor things had such dull lives that it was probably the only thing they could spend their time doing. Looking um, next door culturally, so to speak, at literature, I'm very struck, I don't know, the, not so much pre-Victorian really, but that Coleridgean idea about the unheard melody being sweeter than the heard melody. Yes. Is that something that's picked up in Victorian fiction, Victorian uh, poetry and novels? Well, there was a lot of mention of both fairies and harps in Victorian novels, especially Sir Walter Scott with his marvellous Harp of the North. That, that's a marvellous poem. And another dreadful Welsh one that says, The harp, it hath a magic power, a fairy hovers o'er each string, which is just so appallingly delightful. But one of the classics is Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market. And here's a little quote from it. Did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices. Squeezed from goblin fruits for you, goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me. Laura, make much of me. For your sake, I have braved the glen and had to do with goblin merchant men. Mm. Mm. Sucking the juice from a goblin fruiter. Eh? Yes, that's the stuff. Well, the very title of the CD, Harp of Wild and Dreamlike Strain, is a poem by Emily Bronte. The genre, as it developed elsewhere in Victorian culture, I'm thinking particularly in painting. There was an exhibition mm -hmm. last year at the Royal Academy yes. in London, which I'm sure you know, of, yes. of Victorian fairy painting. It did become highly developed. Yes, it did. Yes, I did a lot of... A lot of work with the Academy during that fairy painting exhibition, so I saw the paintings many times. It's just astounding. The, the art form is a recognised genre of Victorian fairy paintings. When they were first hung at the Academy, there was Lewis Carroll actually wrote excitedly that in one painting he'd counted 167 fairies. <laughs> All up to no good, I hasten to add. <laughs> let's hear some more music and let's hear if we can hear 167 pairs of fairy feet oh. drumming away. so evocative, isn't it? Yes, I mean, you can't right. hear it yes. without seeing some of those images. It's very, very beautiful. When I was actually performing it for the recording, I didn't want to take Victorian fairyland into a modern studio. It felt entirely wrong. So I went to a Victorian ballroom in a rather crumbling 85-roomed mansion down in Devonshire. And as I was actually playing it in this great room with the peeling wallpaper, 
looking out, I could see the leaves rustling on the terraces and these great crumbling stone urns. It was a marvellous experience, and I think that's captured, really. Was it just a kind of, you know, monolithic culture? I mean, an entirely inappropriate word to use in association with fairies, perhaps. But, uh, you know, I suppose that for lots of people, when they think of fairies, they think of the rather gossamer-like creatures that you'd associate with Arthur Rackham and maybe the early years of this century. Yes. But I was looking at some of those Victorian paintings, and the fairies, in fact, seem rather tougher, more mischievous creatures. Yes, they are tougher, and there is a darker element to them. It's not the, the Disney-fied version of fairies that we're used to today. They really did evoke the a lot of the repressed sexuality of the age. If you look at those orgiastic paintings, they're made respectable by the presence of wings. <laughs> <laughs> never underestimate the value of a pair of wings. No, never. <laughs> Let's hear something musically which represents something of perhaps the darker, slightly more sinister side of um, fairy life. Can you tell me about Ondina? Ondina was a very popular 19th century novel of the time by Baron Friedrich de la Motte Fouquet. Oh, there's nobody called Baron Friedrich yes, de la Motte Fouquet. Really, yes, there really is. Baron Friedrich de la Motte Fouquet wrote this incredibly popular novel which tells of a water spirit, an Undine, who is wooed by a knight, Knight Huldbrandt, and he adores her, she's very beautiful and everything a water spirit should be. But after a while he tires of her. He sees a flesh and blood woman in his court who's a great deal more appealing. And poor Undine is superseded by Batalda, the flesh and blood woman. Huldbrand is terribly concerned about the fountain in the castle courtyard because he's a bit worried that Undine might get back in and wreak her revenge through the fountain, so he has it blocked up. And on his wedding night with Batalda, Batalda is in her bedchamber awaiting the consummation and she's worrying about her freckles. <laughs> as if one would be worrying about freckles at such a time. And she knows that the water in the castle fountain is absolutely brilliant for freckles. Huldbrandt, at this moment, is standing half naked in his bedchamber, thinking bitter thoughts, feeling a pang of guilt, you see. Anyway, Bertalda sends her henchmen down to open up the fountain. And as they do so, the stone of the fountain falls back almost of its own accord and up jumps the fountain and it takes the form of a woman weeping. This beautiful woman, veiled and weeping, makes her way across the castle courtyard, up the stairs. She goes in to Knight Huldbrandt's bedroom and she kisses him and with a kiss so passionate that he suffocates and dies. Scorn a water nymph, I guess, is no. the lesson of that piece. <laughs> yes. Um, tell me something about the performance of these pieces. I mean, the, how would the, how would people hear them? I mean, presumably it wasn't simply something that happened in parlours, but was there a sort of concert element? Yes, there was. Yes, the composers would go and give performances, and our great grandparents would come and listen. You can imagine our grandmothers sweating into their corsets with all the excitement of it all. <laughs> it's a respectable way, then, for young women to, maybe not earn a living, but, act, but, but be performers on stage, for example. Or to be performers even in the home environment. Yes, I'm sure, in the home environment, but I don't think it was respectable for a woman to go out. It was men who were actually doing the performing. And so where would you find them? I mean, they'd be kind of on the circuit, if you like. Or wasn't there a court harpist at one time? Yes, there was a court harpist, yes. And, um, in fact, 
John Balsier Chatterton, who's one of the composers. Oh, such wonderful names. I know, isn't it <laughs> lovely? Yes, he played for Queen Victoria. He was her fairy harpist. <laughs> he wrote a lovely piece called uh, Recollections of the Enchantress. <laughs> And anyway, whatever the Enchantress was recollecting, she must have been having a marvellous time because the music is labelled with such words as avec coquetry and the pirates. <laughs> it's all very sort of faintly hysterical, <laughs> isn't it? I think it's not just faintly, I think it's so... Completely hysterical. It's completely hysterical, yes. So in a way, a kind of safety valve for all that Victorian... I don't know, it's a cliché to say Victorian repression, isn't yes. it? But I guess there is something in that, isn't yes, it? Yes, there is something in that. I love it because it's so charming and so harmless and so... There, there's a huge element of, of joy to it, really. I don't think anybody, however cynical and swallowed up by the pressures of 20th century living, would not succumb to its charms. Well, I have to ask you, Elizabeth Jane, <laughs> yes. do you believe in fairies? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. I have to say, I would really love to see one. I've seen one or two suspicious fairy lookalikes. I don't think it matters whether fairies are true or not. All that it matters with any belief is whether our lives are made better or worse by that belief. I think life is certainly more fun if one believes in fairies. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I could. Well, as I try to suspend my disbelief, yes. I think I'd do it much better <laughs> to a musical accompaniment. So let's hear In Twilight Hour. <laughs> All it needs is Percy Edwards doing an owl impression in the background, I doesn't know. it? You could almost be there. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, we, we're on the subject of Twilight. When did Twilight fall on Victorian fairy music? It was really the First World War that crushed it completely. What hope did the poor Victorian fairy have against the harsh realities of, of war? There was such a huge change then that there wasn't room for fanciful nonsense. Nobody had the heart or the spirit for it. That was really when the curtain fell. And did that also represent a sort of general downturn in the harp's fortunes? I, I, I think it's about that time, isn't it, that the upright piano begins to yes, appear in, in yes, middle-class drawing Yes, really, rooms? because of the expense of harps and the difficulty of playing them towards the end of the 19th century, it was the piano that became the popular drawing room instrument and, and pianos were manufactured in huge quantities. So the harp as the young lady's instrument did also die away and in the 20th century, of course, it's come into its own as a concert instrument, but that's another story. <laughs> So what became of these wonderful characters like Charles Obertur, the great pop star of his day? I don't know. He died in 1895, I think it was. In um, relative obscurity, or certainly relative to his, the, his, the high point of his career? No, I think he was still popular when he died. But, of course, without him there, he very quickly fell into obscurity. I mean, do you still think that it has an important part to play in the harp? Repertoire. I mean, it, it was practically unknown now, isn't it? Were yes, it not for your efforts, we, yes. we would never hear this music. No, we'd never known it. I'm the only harpist in the world quite stupid enough to be taken in by this stuff. <laughs> but why do you think that is? Why do you think... I mean, because you listen to it, particularly a piece like Ondina, which is a very, very beautiful piece of yes, music, no matter how beautiful. you cut it's it. It's just a gorgeous melody, yes. But why is it lost, do you think? Why, do you think people don't have the stomach? For, is it too saccharine a diet, do you think, or too ephemeral a phenomenon to, for people to want to continue to hear? 
I think that because of the image of the harp as, as the young lady's instrument, most self-respecting harpists are very keen to move away from that and reveal its value as a concert instrument because it is superb in contemporary music. It's a fantastic and marvellous instrument. And so Victorian fairy harp music doesn't help with building up the image of the harp so as your something name suitable Mert? for today. Uh, so right, at the London Linda Harp Mud, Society. Yes. <laughs> 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 but I have to say that the audiences love the music. I've had so many letters from people and that's just been the most rewarding adventure of all. What is it you think that people are responding to? I think it gives them permission to just just believe in the fairy at the top of the Christmas tree. You know, we all have something inside us that wants there to be magic, and we know that it's not really there, but there's something in us that still hopes there is, and perhaps that's what it is that people respond to. I've had eminent businessmen and even someone who is quite eminent in government come up and confess to me that they do really believe in fairies. <laughs> but I'm not telling any names. <laughs> well, on that bombshell, <laughs> Elizabeth J. Baudry, it's been fantastic talking to you Thank and listening you. to your wonderful music. It's enchanting music, and we're going to leave with John Balsier Chatterton, another of those immortal names, his Recollections of the Enchantress.